All right. I am excited over the fact that we are back into the book of Genesis. And, and we're going to race through the rest of the book of Genesis because by the end of the summer, we will be done with Genesis and we will begin a new sermon series that I will be talking to you about here real soon. But we've got about, I don't know, however many weeks we've got left in, uh, in July and August. We've got that many weeks to finish the book of Genesis. And it gets, gets pretty hot and heavy from here on out. We've got the, the 12 uh, sons of Jacob that formed the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, we've got Joseph uh, and Joseph being sold off to captivity, going off to Egypt, becoming a ruler, the, the great famine. He's re, uh, reunited with his brothers who sold him into slavery. And then we got the end of the book of Genesis where Joseph dies. So we've got a lot to cover, uh, a lot of a lot of the sections that you have told me, like that's my favorite part of the book of Genesis. We're about to get there. We're about to get there. Um, hope you don't miss any week. If you do, all of my sermons are on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel, River Church RGV. You can find it. You can jump on and get caught up with any of our sermons. If you missed any of the last sermon series, which was on supernatural gifts, on healing and prophecy and the gift of tongues. If you missed any of that six-week series, it's all there. It's all recorded um, on, on YouTube. You can go and see where we stand as a church and where I stand as a preacher and a theologian on some of those controversial topics. So go jump on YouTube and watch those. Today, back in the book of Genesis, and we're talking about uh, one of the most odd stories in all of the Bible. Today we're looking at a story about a man who actually wrestled with God and lived to tell about it. Now he went away walking with a limp for the rest of his life, but God graciously spared his life. A man who wrestled with God and live to tell about it. Now my boys, I've got three boys, I've got two girls, my boys tend, tend to be wrestlers. Uh, at different stages in their life, they've wrestled with one another. Uh, now, there's this, this pretty great disparity between each one of the three of them. I've got a 23-year-old and a 13-year-old and a 9-year-old. And so there's the pecking order uh, has been established uh, for the time being. I warn them all, like, that will change. Uh, but for now, they don't wrestle much because everyone knows who will win and who will lose. Uh, there have been some opportunities uh, over the course of the last, you know, 23 years for me as a dad to wrestle with my boys. And there was a stage where if I wrestled, I had to wrestle kind of with, figuratively speaking, with one, one hand tied behind my back. Now, at least two of them, if, all, if not all three of them, can kick my butt, so I don't wrestle with them anymore. Uh, but there's been some wrestling going on in our house over the years. But imagine wrestling with God himself. We're going to, I'm going to give you uh, a bit of a review of a man by the name of, of Jacob because he's the one that wrestled with God. Jacob. Jacob, Jacob had done a lot of wrestling throughout his life with a lot of different people. Jacob was a deeply dissatisfied person. Uh, some of us in this room today are just like that. He was chronically dissatisfied with life. He wrestled with a number of people. I'll remind you who they are or who they were. Uh, he wrestled with a number of people always attempting to get something that he could never quite achieve. He went through his entire life looking for someone's favor, attempting to achieve the, the blessing, the, the you're okay, man, uh, from someone in life, but he could never get it. Now, he was a twin. Uh, Jacob and Esau, Los Cuates. You remember the story about Jacob and Esau? Uh, they, they're, they're twins, uh, but Jacob, the, the guy we're talking about, 
He was second born. He wasn't first born. Now, yeah, they're twins. They're born, but, but somebody has to come out first. You know that. And so Esau was the first born. The odd story of that birth, though, is, is that when Jacob, even though he was born, uh, born second, when he was being birthed, he came out holding on, grasping the heel of his, of his brother. As if to say, I want some no- notoriety. I want to go first. I want some attention. And he went through his entire life looking for that and never really receiving it. He, he, he had a dad who favored the brother. Their father favored Esau. And some of you know how, how that can really screw you up. Uh, Esau was, was, uh, was a hairy dude, the older, the, the older of the twins. He was, he was the hunter uh, the outdoorsman, he was the man's man, and the dad always favored Esau. And Jacob, from, from day one, was, was reaching and was grasping for something that he couldn't quite achieve, and that is, that is the favor, the blessing of another. It... it it turned. It, 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 it had. There was this weird uh, turn in the whole story when he's uh, perhaps a teenager or a young adult man. Uh, he actually Jacob attempts to trick his dad into blessing him instead of blessing his older brother Esau. You've heard perhaps the word primogenitor. It's the it's the the the, the, the practice, the ancient and still to this day in some. Uh, cultures, the, the ancient practice of uh, the older brother getting it all, uh, receiving all of the inheritance. And, and so, so Jacob lived in that culture. He lived under uh, that sort of oppressive practice. And so, so he one day actually dresses up in Esau's stinky manly clothes, and he puts uh, like fur on his arms because his dad was was basically blind and he takes him some wild game stew and he pretends to be his brother. You remember the dad says like, the voice I hear is of Jacob, ah, but the smell that I smell is of Esau. Uh, and, and he attempts, uh, I believe futilely, he attempts to receive the favor and the blessing and maybe even the, uh, the monetary um, reward of that, 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 that rightfully went to his brother. He, he tried to trick his dad. And, and, and then, as a result of that, his, his older brother Esau says to him in private, he says, listen, I'm going to kill you. Mom and dad are elderly. I, I'm going to wait till they die, and then I'm going to kill you. So he, he's off to a foreign land, running from, uh, from the death threat of his brother. He's off to a foreign land with nothing, no money, uh, no, no inheritance, because that was the culture of the day. He had to go find his own way, and he runs off to a foreign country, uh, and he, he, he uh, works for his, his, his future brother-in-law, uh, father-in-law, who was, who was a jerk, uh, who, who was a uh, who was dishonest and conniving, and 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 again he is trying to win the favor, win the blessing, win the okay of another, and then he finds himself through trickery married to the wrong gal, uh, and then then and in his mind the wrong gal, and then eventually now he's got two wives, double trouble, and he's, he marries the woman that he initially wanted to marry, and he starts having kids, but there's this hole. There's this gaping hole in his heart that he can't fill. So when we pick up today, he has now left the oppressive uh, land of his, uh, the oppressive rule of his uh, conniving father-in-law. Basically, he took, took uh, his two wives, that man's two daughters, and he, he runs away 
with the, uh, the, the great wealth that he had accrued on his own, and, and he leaves the foreign land, and he is now headed home to, to face his brother. So where we pick up, he's moving, he's moving home with his family, uh, but, but in the text, we won't read this part today, but, but in the text, his, uh, his brother is, is coming to meet him. He has, I guess, uh, Jacob, I guess, has, has spies or runners who have gone ahead, who have said, Esau, your brother, he is coming to greet you. However, he's coming to greet you with 400 men. So, so, so Jacob is, is traveling with his entourage through this desert land, and he, he uh, is faced with the almost certainty that his brother will kill him in the morning. The sun's going down, it's dark, and Jacob takes a look at his family, takes a look at his servants and his possessions, and he decides that he needs some time to himself to, 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 to earnestly pray. So he sends his, his wives and his, his family, his possessions, everything across the river to go ahead, and he stays behind to pray. And he's, he's looking into the heavens... Jacob is contemplating this promise. Remember this promise that God had made that, 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 that your offspring will be like the number of the stars? Yes, God had told that to Abraham. Uh, God had told that to Isaac. But God had also told, uh, made that promise to, to Jacob. So he knows, he knows God has said that, that my offspring will be like the stars. And, and yet my brother is going to kill me in the morning. So I imagine him tired, bodily tired, but I imagine him to have a restless mind at this moment. He's, he feels like he's been running all of his life. A few of you in this room probably feel that way. You've just been running all of your life. And so he prays a prayer, and it, it goes like this. Dark of the night, He's all alone. He says, please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he may come and attack me, the mothers with the children. In other words, his family. But you said, God, you said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. So he stayed there that night all by himself. And, and from what he had... Uh, with him, he took a present for his brother Esau. The word I think of when I read that is just how pitiful. Uh, he's, he's praying, and that's cool, but what is he doing? He's like putting together a gift package for his brother. Like, like making a gift basket, not exactly, but he's, he's preparing some gift, this kind of a sad place to find yourself all alone in the middle of the night, waiting to see if your brother is going to slaughter you come daybreak. But then what happens next? This is, this is the odd part of the story. What happens next is, if you can imagine, f from out of the quietness, of the dark night comes a human form. Maybe, maybe this human form even, even climbed out of the creek or climbed out of the river. And it's coming at him, and it's clearly a man. And could it be Esau? No, it's not Esau because it's not the walk of Esau. He knows his brother. So this figure comes at him, <clears throat> Clearly ready to take him, uh, clearly ready to take him on as an opponent. In this this ancient Eastern practice of wrestling, as if to say, "You want to go?" 
And that's where we pick up in verse 24. It says, And Jacob was left alone, and a man, a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day, meaning until the sun was about to come up. So all night. When the man saw that, that he did not prevail against Jacob, <clears throat> he touched his hip socket. And in the original language, this would mean he just barely, just barely touched him. And Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. So he barely touches him, and his hip explodes. Then he, this figure, this man, he said, Let me go, for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, My name is Jacob. Then he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob. But Israel, for you have striven with God and with men, and you have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But, but he said, why is it that you ask my name? And then he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, <clears throat> the people of Israel, as a nation, as a culture, uh, they do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket of their livestock, what they eat. They don't eat that part because... He, God, touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. The word of the Lord, for which I give thanks. Okay, so let me give you a summary before we try, start trying to unpack, okay, what does this mean for me in my life? Uh, summary, Jacob wrestles with God all night, and, and God... Let's Jacob hold his own. In, in other words, Jacob thought he was making headway. God, Jacob thought he was uh, making some progress in his struggle. Have you ever wrestled with the Lord and you thought you were making progress? <laughs> then, just before daybreak, perhaps because God has told us, no man can see my face what, and live, just before daybreak, just before the sun comes up and Jacob could actually see his face, God lightly touches his hip and it's shattered. And even through the pain, even through the excruciating pain of a shattered hip, Jacob won't let go. I won't let go until you bless me, he says. Now what has Jacob been looking for his whole life? Blessing. Jacob realized at that moment that what he'd been searching for all his life could be found in the Lord. And the Lord blesses him. It says so. The Lord blesses him, which is exactly what he wanted, exactly what he'd been looking for. And then he walks away from that encounter. He walks away with a limp. So much so that, that the nation of Israel honors that that limp with their, with, the, with, with their diet. A limp that he would carry for the rest of his life, but a limp that I would say no doubt was worth it. Let me ask you a question. Are you right now in your life, are you praying desperately and in fear this, this very moment? J Jacob, Jacob, that night before the Lord approached him and wrestled with him, he was, he was fearing uh, for his physical safety and the safety of his family, and he's praying desperately and in fear. Are you, are you in that scenario, that situation, at this very moment? 
in your own life. In the year 2012, just before we planted River Church, in the year 2012, Lydia, my, 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 my precious wife, Lydia and I were, were having a, a tiring conversation one evening about all of the challenges of our life at that moment in time. And I remember just before we slumbered off to sleep, Lydia commented, Randy, it seems like nothing is coming easy for us these days. It seems like nothing is coming easy for us these days. Have you ever felt that way? Maybe you feel that way now. Sort of like you're in a wrestling match with life. Like maybe you're not sure where God is in all of this, but you feel like you wrestle with everyone. In every situation, life is just one big wrestling match. Let me tell you about that, 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 uh, that year, 2012, for me, so you can understand uh, the context behind Lydia's, conversa- uh, Lydia's comment. Here's, here's this, really the summer of 2012 for us, for the Caulfield family. Early in, early in the summer of 2012, number one, I was uh, deeply dissatisfied at work. Number two, my father, Ronald Caulfield, was, uh, was dying from cancer. He was being treated and the treatment was not working. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to number every one of these, but there's about 14, 14 details. Um, summer of 2012. Next, I took my, my family, Lydia, and all five kids on like an epic vacation. We went to, uh, not an expensive vacation, but an epic vacation. Uh, we went to Yellowstone Park, and we were gone for a couple of weeks, and we saw stuff that my youngest kids had never seen before. And then we came home. We came home, and my father was now in hospice care, and, and he only had a few weeks to live. And then next he died within a few weeks and I preached his funeral. And then days after I preached my father's funeral, I quit my job. Next, I, uh, Lydia and I talked about it and and I, we went and I, I used some of my uh, tax return money as sort of seed money and we, we purchased uh, a skiff, a boat, so that I could go back to what I had done for a few years, and that was guiding fly fishermen on the Laguna Madre so with, so in order to provide to make a living for my family. We're still in the same summer. This is still summer 2012. Uh, bought a boat, and I determined that that's what I would do to provide for my family. I would go back to guiding. And then we planted River Church, and a handful of you were there in August of 2012. Then within a few weeks or a month, my grandmother died, and I, I preached her funeral. And then, we're now moving into the fall, because you can't pack too much into the summer. Uh, in the fall of 2012, my, my mother, who you know, who's here today, she had a pretty massive stroke, and, and uh, she was in my care. And I remember late... In 2012, I remember looking at myself in the mirror. And I remember thinking that I liked the man that I saw for the first time in a while. You see, I thought that I needed God to deliver me from every one of those circumstances. And I thought that I needed every one of those circumstances to be worked out totally the way that I wanted them to and expected them to. And honestly, of of those 14 details, very few of them worked out the way that I 
thought I needed them to work out. I thought I needed God to, to deliver me from my circumstances. What I really needed to do, I really needed to do a little wrestling. What I really needed was I needed to ask for and earnestly seek the Lord's blessing, the Lord's favor. And as a result of, of, of all of that 2012, I walked away with a, with a bit of a limp. But that's okay. Um, some of you have heard me, or you've all heard me say this. I, I, somewhere along the line, in the last several years, I have started calling myself old, like, like I'm an old man. I'm old. And some of you laugh because you're like, ah, oh, you're still a youngster. And some of you are like, oh, no, he is old. He is an old man. But, but what I would tell you, what I would tell you is that I started thinking of myself as old in 2012. I remember that. I remember I started noticing some gray and, and I started feeling a bit of the weight of all that had happened. And, and, and after just a series of, of, of tiring and even uh, debilitating sort of circumstances, I made it through 2012 with a, with a bit of a limp. But it was worth it. If you're living in fear today and you're crying out to God to, to deliver you and you're wrestling with God in prayer, God, if you don't bless me, I don't think I can, I don't think I can get up from this place. On your knees, on your face, God, if, if, if you don't bless me, I, I won't move from this spot until you bless me. What I want to assure you, that's a good place to be. It's not a comfortable place to be. It's not an easy place to be, but it's a good place to be. May I ask you a few questions that you can answer in your own, in the silence of your own heart? What, what are you asking from the Lord today? What do you need most from the Lord today? Might it be that you need the favor and the approval and the comfort of the Lord today more than anything else? Let's talk about some lessons learned from Jacob's wrestling with God. I hope that these will bless you. Lessons learned from Jacob's wrestling with God. Here's the first one. God's idea of comfort and my idea of ease are not the same idea. Any seasoned veterans here? Can I get an amen? God's idea of comfort, my idea of ease, are not the same idea. My idea of ease it would be like me and my wife in Belize, like sleeping late, or like I get up early and go bone fishing, and then I come back and she wakes up, and we we party the day away and go to bed late, and and just ease like that. That to me, that's ease. But that's not God's idea of comfort. My idea, His idea, two different ideas. See, God's idea of comfort is is support and strengthening and empathy. Remember, our Lord is described as one who, who is a sympathetic counselor, who knows all your sorrows, who knows all your temptations. He has experienced everything Jesus has, everything that you have experienced. God's idea of comfort is support and empathy and strengthening. My idea of ease is no trouble. The path of least resistance. It is our Lord and Savior Himself who said this, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So those are the words of Jesus. God never promised to make life easy. 
Anyone who says so is misleading people. See, when I want the good life, God wants the strong life. There's a second lesson we learn from Jacob's wrestling with the Lord. That's this. An encounter with God leaves me weakened physically and strengthened spiritually. See, left to ourselves, we would probably trade one for the other. I, I, I would probably choose, just left to myself, to be physically safe and out of harm's way, and strengthened, not weakened. But, but the Lord will trade that any day for our spiritual strength our spiritual staying power. What you're going through today <clears throat> is in keeping with God's heart for you, and that is that, that you would be strengthened spiritually. That you might walk away from this circumstance, perhaps with a limp. But that's okay. Uh, I suppose that day... I suppose that day uh, Jacob would have said, my body is broken and my faith is made strong. I've read several theologians, writers this week who have said, an encounter with the Lord always leaves you physically weakened and spiritually strengthened. And look, you've got to be okay with that. If you say that you're a Christ follower, if you say that you are following the teachings of Jesus, then you've got to be okay with this truth. Because this truth is, is throughout the Bible taught and preached, affirmed. The third lesson that we learn from Jacob's wrestling with the Lord is this. God calls me out of a fearful preoccupation with self. Let's just stop for a second. How many of us are living right there, right now? I, I feel your pain. I struggle with what you struggle with. I'm way more like you than you think I am. We're just preoccupied with ourself. Just can't stop thinking but myself. And what does that lead to? Every time, every time, what does it lead to? Fear. Because when I'm preoccupied with myself, what I realize is I cannot really protect myself. There are dangers that I have no control over. I could get sick. I could experience financial ruin. A loved one could leave me. A loved one could die. There are so many ways this could go bad. What we learn from this wrestling match is that God calls me out of a fearful preoccupation with self and into a deeply focused relationship with Him. Remember, God pursued Jacob in this wrestling match. Remember, that, that night, that night Jacob, he was just stewing in his own anxiety. Some of us do that. Most of us do that. All of us do that. We just, we just stew in our anxiety. He's, that night he's... He's stewing in his anxiety over Esau and, and his impending doom. Uh, he's going to be slaughtered or killed uh, at daybreak. I imagine him saying, God, will you get rid of this enemy? You've prayed that. I know you have. God, will you get rid of this enemy? We just wipe them out. We just obliterate them. You're for me. You're against them. Won't you just, won't you just get rid of my enemy? And, and, and God says, no, this wrestling match... 
This wrestling match will be a means of my grace. This wrestling match will be a means of my blessing. Out of this, out of this, as a result of this, you will receive my favor. It's in this dark moment. It's in this wrestling match. It's in this danger. It's in this impending doom. Right in the middle of it will the blessing come. And then I, I believe God would say something like this. Dear child, you're not wrestling with your enemy. I know it seems like it. But you're actually wrestling with me. And I will bless you. We will wrestle for a while and I will I will give you the impression that you're winning. Um, but out of this will come the blessing. And you know what? You know what Jacob said at the end of that? All of that. He walks away from that wrestling match as the sun's coming up and he says these words he says I have seen God face to face now if you can think back you it was it was, it was months ago when I preached on it but but if you can think back uh, to the story of several chapters back in Genesis um, we looked at it before Easter um, Jacob has left his home. He's still a single man. He just tried to trick his dad, uh, with, and his mom helped him, which made it even worse on the family. Uh, Esau told him he's going to kill him, uh, and 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 so chronologically, this is decades earlier. Uh, he he ends up in 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 Bethel. He ends up in Bethel. Uh, he hasn't made his way to his, the foreign land yet. He hasn't uh, met his wives, his wife, wives yet. He hasn't met his father-in-law yet. None of that has happened. And in Bethel, in Bethel, he has this prophetic dream experience in which angels are going up and down staircase and God's at the staircase. And I believe that the, what, that, what that prophetic dream meant is I believe God's saying, hey, the distance between you and me is way less than you think it is. The, the distance between the spiritual and the physical, it's, it's compressed. It's way less than you think it is. And if you recall, what, what, uh, when, when Jacob woke up there at Bethel that day after, after sleeping the night and having this crazy dream, he says, surely the Lord was in this place all along and I now see it. So he had that experience. He went away had several decades of God's favor and, and, and growing his wealth and, and having a family, and now he's coming back home. And he finds himself in, in Peniel, Peniel, uh, several ways that it can be said. And once again, he has this prophetic, dream-like, except I think it was actually a real, uh, a real occurrence, but prophetic, no doubt, in which he wrestles with the Lord Decades later, again, he says, I have now seen God face to face. Interestingly, my, my daughter went to Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, and my daughter went to, uh, worked at a camp called Camp Penile, right? Wherever you are. Um, there's nothing to do with the story, but she's my daughter, so give her, give her a little, little shout out. Um, He's seen God face to face. An encounter with God leaves me weakened physically, but strengthened spiritually. Fourth lesson is this. I don't mostly need God to fix my circumstances. I mostly need God to fix my heart. I've been saying this in sermons now for about 10 years. And I say that because I have people that will come to me and say, remember, Randy, you say this, and I've been thinking about this, and I want you to just tuck this, this truth away in your heart and wait for, and I hope it doesn't come, but it most likely will, wait for the next tragedy. And then what I want you, what I want you to remember is this lesson from Jacob's life. I don't mostly need God to fix my circumstances. I mostly need him to fix my heart. I think I know what I need from God. 
I need for him to fix my problems right now and in the manner that I want them fixed. And did I mention right now? But that's not mostly what I need. Jacob began the night believing that his greatest need was escape from Esau. He ended the night believing his greatest need was to trust in the blessing of God's promise. Next lesson is this. Wrestling with God changes my identity. It changed Jacob's. In fact, in Jacob's case, he gets a whole new name. But in every one of our lives, wrestling with God gives us a new identity. We walk away, uh, we walk away no longer fearing that Esau, whoever Esau is in your life. We walk away instead enjoying the favor and the blessing of the Lord. But Jacob got a whole new name. His name meant, meant several things. It, 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 it meant one who grasps. It also meant uh, cheater. Uh, but then God says that he changes his name to Israel, meaning one who strives with God, like one who wrestles with the Lord. Not to say, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really orthodox, like I'm a literalist when it comes to the Bible. I really believe the Bible means what it says, and, and I think that usually the simplest interpretation of what you read is, is, is the right interpretation of what you read. So I really take the Bible seriously, accurately, literally. But I got to say, when people, when people like, they, they have a baby, and like, should we name him Nolan? No. Should we name him Boyce? No. Let's name him Cheater. Let's name him Scoundrel. I still don't get that. I don't understand why they would do that. But somehow, somehow that would happen, and the Lord changes his name. I don't know if the Lord's, the Lord's going to change your name, but the Lord is going to change your identity. It's good to wrestle with God. It's good to get on your knees and lean into God and have your faith tested and strengthened and say, thank you, God, for those moments in my life. See, when God calls us to wrestle with him, there's always something good that will come out of that. It is always a faith builder. When God wrestles with you, it is always to build your faith, to strengthen you spiritually. Why is that significant? Hebrews 11 says this, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So what I, so what I would say to you today is seek the Lord. Wrestle with the Lord. That is how you please God. Think on that, that you might actually please the Lord, that you might actually bring the smile of the favor of the Lord. That you might wrestle with Him today, and then He might actually smile down on you. What does it even mean to wrestle with God? I believe praying that, 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 that is wrestling with the Lord looks something like this. Asking and weeping and begging and pleading and petitioning and blubbering and, and, and groaning and fasting and persisting in our prayers. God, I won't get up until you bless me. When God calls us to wrestle with him, there is always more to come than we can even comprehend. And it's always for our good. You see, God, he is not reluctant to bless you. God is eager to bless you. Your understanding of blessing and God's understanding of blessing may be different, but he is eager. For the first time ever, Jacob walked away from a wrestling match with a deep sense of satisfaction, with a deep sense of the Lord's favor, with a deep sense of the blessing of the Lord. That's what he'd been looking for his entire life. For some dad, for some father-in-law, for some figure to bless him, to favor him. He had been searching and now he had found it. He walked with a limp, yes, but that was a good reminder. 
Yeah, I wonder sometimes in my own life, you know, 2012, how did that affect me physically? But you know, if it, even if it took off a few months of my life, maybe if my life is shortened, maybe I'm a little bit less healthy at 50. Maybe it did make me old. But that's okay. I wouldn't change that year. Again, as we get ready to pray, I, I ask, what do you need from God right now? What do, you, what do you need from God right now? He is eager to bless you. He is waiting to bless you. It, it, it may not look the way you think it should look, but trust Him. Keep Keep wrestling with Him. Keep waiting on the Lord. Don't let go until He blesses you. What I would tell you is this. The Lord loves tenacious faith. Let's pray.